Okay, welcome to module 0.1. Uh, in today's lecture, we're going to talk about the fundamentals that you'll need to complete the Minitorch project. Today's class will have four parts in it. We'll begin by introducing the coding structure of module 0. We'll talk about setting up your development environment. We'll talk about how we plan to do unit testing for this class using property testing. And we'll end by talking about some of the basics of functional programming in Python. Just a reminder that all the material for this class is available at minitorch.github.io. This will give you a full description of the material in today's lecture and provide kind of extra details and content. So um, at the end of this class, we'll have set up our testing environment. We'll be able to access all the modules. We'll have access to our visualization and we'll be ready to go. We're not gonna do any machine learning yet. In fact, we won't get to machine learning until module one. So to begin this class, you're going to want to go to github.com mini torch module zero. Be sure to check that code out and have it available to look through as you go. Uh, this will be kind of critical to understand the content of today's class. <laughs> Let's begin by taking a brief tour of the underlying repo. We'll have three different directories to start with in each assignment. In mini torch, we have the main library code that you'll utilize and build throughout. In tests, we'll have our unit and property test to make sure the library works. And in project, we'll have user code that builds machine learning models to test out our underlying library. Each of the different modules will require writing code in each of these three directories. So for module zero, one of the main goals is to get used to them and understand how they work. Minitorch can be completed with any IDE of your choosing. In practice though, I found that most students utilize VS code it's a popular choice for the class because it makes it very easy to do testing and debugging of errors. If you decide to use VS Code, this is a good time to set up your environment, install extensions for testing and debugging. When working on an open source project, it's critical to understand the project's contribution guidelines. We're writing a library for others to use, so we want to make sure we do it in a way that's editable, extensible, and sticks to the main core goals of the underlying project. In Minitorch, we provide a pre-commit file, which gives the main libraries that need to pass in order for the code to be completed. You can look at the pre-commit file and see how we enforce style guidelines, typing guidelines, as well as kind of basic structures to the documentation of the project. In particular, we're going to use standardized formatting throughout the project itself. You'll want to set up your IDE to use black which is a library that provides auto formatting of Python code. You can also run this from the command line, which will go through each of your files and make sure they obey our style guidelines. In order to check for the various style formatting properties, we'll use a customized Flake 8 configuration file. Again, you can set this up so your IDE checks for it automatically, or you can run it from the command line to find all the issues in your code. In general, using Black and Flake 8 is an important step in moving beyond notebooks to write real library code that is used by real users. In addition, you can set up your GitHub repository to do continuous integration, running your tests and style checks every time you commit and push to your module zero. This allows you to check that everything is working at the time of commit and also when you finalize a module. In general, the Minitorch project is documented with a standardized style which is known as the Google Doc style. For each function, we have a short description of what it does, as well as each of the individual arguments. Minitorch also utilizes static type checks throughout the code base. These can be seen here with the multiplication function, taking in X and Y as arguments, both of which are floats, and returning a float argument. We will find typing to be a very nice way to check our code and understand some of the more complex concepts throughout the lectures. Modern Python supports a wide range of different generic types. So for instance, we'll often have to import from the typing module to get uh, different types, such as an iterable type over floats. I will also see functional types such as callable later in the lecture. Before we start writing code, I wanna emphasize that an important part of this class is understanding unit tests and why they're critically important for modern machine learning code. Practically, each assignment will have several different test files in the test directory. These are written using the standard PyTest framework. You can run them from the command line with the command PyTest, 
or you can run the tests for an individual homework problem using the dash M option. As I mentioned earlier, you can also set this up to run in your IDE. The way PyTest works is that it searches through the test directory to find files that begin with the word test. Within each of these files, it finds all the functions that begin with the word test, and it selects which tests actually run using filters. One thing to be aware of in this class is that the test output can be quite verbose. You'll often have to go through and read the actual test errors to understand what's going on and read the tests themselves. Don't assume you can kind of get through this assignment without actually looking into the test code that we wrote and what it's actually testing under the hood. Finally, just be aware that the way the tests actually work is that it tries to run your code and it checks for a bunch of different asserts. If the asserts fail, the test will fail. Otherwise, uh, the test will pass. To understand the actual details behind this, you'll have to look both into the assert function as well as assert close, which allows us to check for answers that are close to the true value. To understand why testing is complicated for machine learning, let's look at one of our module zero functions. Uh, this function has the name ReLU, and we'll see that it becomes one of the stars of the show later on in the class. For now, we can just look at the documentation and see that the function is quite simple. It takes in an argument x. If x is greater than zero, it returns the original value. Otherwise, it returns the value zero. We'd like to test that our implementation of this function is correct. However, it can be a bit tricky to think about how to do this. We want to know that the function works both when it's implemented in a very simple way and also later in the class when we implement it more efficiently. The problem comes up in that if we run kind of standard tests that we might run for kind of a standard non-machine learning uh, program, we don't end up testing very much of the space of inputs. We can write down a couple of different values. For instance, we can check the value at 10 and the value at negative 10. But this doesn't give us much coverage of the space of possible failures. In fact, you might argue that it basically covers none of the possible values. What we'd really like is to test that for every possible input to ReLU, we get the correct answer. We can imagine a function that iterates over every possible floating point value that's positive, checks that it returned the original value, and then iterates over every value that's negative and checks that it returns zero. This would be the ideal test, uh, but of course it would be uh, much too much time to run and we would not be able to kind of run our test regularly. In this class, we're going to use an idea known as property testing. Uh, this idea originates from the use of quick check, uh, which you can read about on the Wikipedia page. We're going to use a version of quick check written in Python, which goes by the name Hypothesis. Hypothesis is a wonderfully written and well-documented library that implements many of the core ideas of property testing in a way that are easy and simple to use in Python. You should think of Hypothesis as making a compromise. What it will do is it will produce a set of different values for us to check. Our test will just check that these values obey the properties that we're interested in. And we will be able to give Hypothesis a wide variety of constraints over what values we'd like to check. We can both tell it to produce generic floating point values and also give it specific examples that we want to run. Throughout the course, you'll find it very useful to provide specific examples that you think are easier or simpler to actually check, but you'll also find that things don't really work until you're able to satisfy the random values that Hypothesis gives you. In the assignment, you'll play with some more complex constraints, and in future assignments, you'll see more complex custom generators of various properties. Uh, this is a very powerful feature, and it can be used to test all sorts of varieties of machine learning systems. I'm going to conclude today's lecture by talking about functional programming in Python. We're going to be doing some basic high-level functional programming, which will connect to machine learning in future lectures. When I talk about functional programming, I'm really just talking about a style of programming where functions can be passed and returned just like any other object. Python is not an aggressively functional language. It's one of several different paradigms that can be used. In general, we'll find this to be a very useful programming paradigm when working with mathematical objects. The way we type functions in Python is by using typing import callable. When we have a function like add or multiply, 
These are functions that take in two floating point values and return a floating point value. These functions have type callable float float mapping to float. And we can show this by assigning a variable v to the add function and ensuring that that is its type. This becomes useful when we want to pass a function as an argument to another function. Here we define a function combine three that takes fn as an argument. fn is of type callable float float to float. And combine three also takes three other arguments a, b, and c. The return value of combine three is just a float itself. And we produce that float by using fn twice in sequence to produce the final value. In practice, this allows us to convert in a function that takes two arguments into one that takes three arguments, as you can see at the bottom of the code. We can also provide functions as return values. And once we start doing this, the type signatures get a little bit more hairy. Now we define a function combine three that just takes fn as an argument. But note that its return type is a function that takes three floating point values and returns a floating point value. In this class, we'll define these functions as returns by defining an inner function. So in particular, here I define an inner function, new fn. It takes three floating point values and returns a floating point value. And it computes its return value by just applying fn twice. We then return this inner function as the return value of the outer function combined three. In our examples below, we can see that this allows us to transform a function of two arguments into a new function that takes three arguments. Again, the utility of doing this is not clear, but in later lectures, we'll find this to be very valuable and a way to kind of abstract a simple mathematical operator into one that can be run in various different configurations. The difference between this and the previous slide is that we end up with a new function add three and we can utilize it and pass it as arguments to other functions. We can use this to construct some of the classical combinators of functional programming. In particular, we'll start with a higher order filter example. This allows us to transform a function from float to bool into a function that can be run over an iterable. So in particular, in this simple example, we'll pass in a function that returns a Boolean value. We'll then create an inner function apply that takes in an iterable argument. We'll then run the fn function over each of the elements of apply. We'll check whether it returned true or false. And depending on that condition, we'll either keep or throw away that value. When we apply this in practice, we can write a function like more than four that returns a Boolean value. We can then call a filter on more than four and get back a new function that maps from iterables to iterables. We then apply this filter to a new list of values, and it will return only the ones that have a higher value than four. In module zero, you'll be implementing core functional programming concepts. This includes map, zip, and reduce. My rules of thumb are that when in doubt, be sure to write out the definitions and type signatures, and be sure to document the types of each of the arguments that you're sending and receiving. Finally, don't be afraid to write out tests for your functions just using standard for loops. One of the nice things about property testing is that you can always uh, test complex structures with simpler, more uh, kind of basic structures that you understand very well. Great, so that about does it for module 0.1. In the next class, we'll dive into some of the core constructs of Minitorch and get you fully completed on module 0.